Hi, folks. I'm Brian Atwood, second vice president of the Valley Forge chapter of the Sons of the American Revolution here in the Lehigh Valley of Pennsylvania. It's a pleasure to be joining you and we're in your living rooms or wherever you're joining us from today. There's folks from all over the country who are with us right now, uh, as far away as Kentucky and Ohio, New York City, and uh, I know there's some folks from the Carolinas joining us too today. So thank you for joining us. Our presentation today is uh, not only being hosted by our chapter, but we're fortunate enough to be doing it right here in the Bethlehem Masonic Center here in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. They've been kind enough to allow us to use the space here for our presentation. I'd like to thank George Hickson, our former president of the chapter for making the arrangements with the folks at the Masonic Center. And I'd also like to thank David and Ali Hunsaker for uh, allowing us to make this Zoom presentation, the first of, of its kind here in our chapter. I'd also like to uh, thank some folks for joining us today from the American Friends of Lafayette, the Historic Society honoring the Marquis, which was formed in 1932 during Lafayette College's centennial celebration. And also the folks from Lafayette Trail Incorporated, a nonprofit organization formed to map, mark, and promote General Lafayette's triumphal tour of America in 1824 and 1825 in preparation for its upcoming bicentennial. Our speaker today is a Lafayette College alum, a life member of the American Friends of Lafayette, an officer of the Lafayette College alumni of the Lehigh Valley, a member of the Valley Forge chapter, SAR, our own chapter, and chief administrative officer, researcher, and treasurer for the Lafayette Trail. Having earned a bachelor's degree in engineering from Lafayette College and a master's from the Wharton School of Finance, John Bessica's interests in history began with an invitation during the 1976 bicentennial of the American Revolution to research and write the revolutionary history of his hometown, Hohokus, New Jersey. He's since published two booklets on the topic, and he's also been active at the Hermitage and Historic House in Hohokus, where Washington, Lafayette, and other officers were entertained after the Battle of Monmouth, and also where Aaron Burr married the widow Theodosia Prevo. John graduated Lafayette in 1969, and at his 30th reunion, he attended a lecture given by the college archivist. The topic was General Lafayette. Little had been said about the Lafayette during John's college years, and he was hooked right away. As a result of the lecture, he started reading about our hero, and he joined the American Friends of Lafayette. His most recent experiences with the AFL group have included traveling to greet Lafayette's replica ship, the Hermione, at its arrival in Yorktown, Virginia in 2015, touring Lafayette-related sites in Boston in 2016, attending Yorktown Victory Day in 2017, and visiting Lafayette-related sites in Annapolis in 2018 and in the Tidewater area of Virginia in 2021. These experiences have inspired him to want to share the story of this important person in our country's founding with historic groups and the general public. And it's an honor for us to be able to have him here with us today. If you have any questions that you'd like to ask during the presentation, I encourage you to save them for the end. Perhaps you can write them in the chat section on our Zoom meeting today. And also, if you could, if you could please mute your microphone, if it happens to be on right now, that would be a big help to John, as John Bessica makes his presentation today. There you go, John. Well, today I'm gonna to start with a sad story. And it's about a Lafayette College professor, esteemed alumnus, taught history at the school for years, became the college, first college archivist in his retirement, and uh, wrote the third volume of the history of the college. His name is Al Jendabeen. He was giving a 1989 speech to the Northampton County, Pennsylvania Historical and Genealogical Society, and I quote, a few years ago, a student from a neighboring institution, happened to be 
Lehigh University, Lafayette's big sports rival, interviewed me about co-education at Lafayette College. In the course of our talk, she asked me, why is the college named Lafayette? Was he a local benefactor or something? Well, Al continues, I hardly need tell you what happened to my esteem for my colleagues up the river. So this is the problem we have. Lafayette is not well known in this country. And we're trying to turn that around. Yes, he's better known as America's famous fighting Frenchman from the musical Hamilton, but that's only a start. So at the end of this presentation, we hope you learned something you didn't know. Not moving. Here are my technical guys here. Doesn't want to advance. There we go. Lafayette is known as the hero of two worlds for his roles in the American and French revolutions. My talk today will only consider how he affected the United States. His early life, his role in the American Revolution, and his two return visits to America. I'm not going to, going to talk about how he was a crusader for human rights. Uh, I'm going to emphasize his role in the American Revolution. But he was a person who believed that everybody was equal. He was a staunch abolitionist, and he treated everyone he met exactly the same as everyone else. In 2002, Congress finally recognized Lafayette as an honorary US citizen, only the sixth person to be so honored in our country's history. So who the heck was this guy? What was his background? What did he look like? What motivated him to come to America and get involved with our war with England? How did he come to be such a celebrity in America? These are some of the issues I will address in this presentation. Lafayette's parents. In the French aristocracy of the time, marriage had nothing to do with friendship, compatibility, love, romance, or even lust. Marriages were arranged for young people by their elders with two goals in mind, the consolidation of power and prestige and the merger of family fortunes. In Lafayette's case, his father came from a long line of military noblemen and his mother's family was exceedingly wealthy due to their extensive land holdings in the Brittany section of France. Not doesn't like me. Well, that was the slide you missed. <laughs> and this you saw. And here we are. All right. Lafayette is born September 6, 1757, at his father's family ancestral home, Chateau Chauvignac, a stone castle built in the 14th century in, in Auvergne, France. The day after his birth, he is baptized with this big long name. His friends called him Gilbert. As fate would have it, he would, grown up, would grow up as an only child. It's, it's slow and reacting, I guess. So here you have Paris up in the upper part and Chavagnac down below, 300, 300 miles south of Paris. Uh, Chavagnac still stands today. You can go there. It's run by what we would call the county government here in this country. And uh, you can take a tour. It was built in the 14th century. It came into the Lafayette family with uh, Lafayette's grandmother's dowry. And here we see the whole area. It's been compared to the rugged terrain of Americans, Appalachia. Doesn't want to advance. Uh, these are th three other views of Chavagnac. 
he was supposedly born in the right hand tower in the window you see. You can't see the first floor from all the shrubbery, but uh, the right hand tower window was his birthplace. Lafayette's father, one of a long line of soldiers in the family, was killed in action at the Battle of Minden in Prussia during the Seven Years' War with Britain. Lafayette was barely two years old and thus did not know his father. He inherits the title Marquis de Lafayette at his father's death. Lafayette's mother, pregnant and stricken with grief, leaves country life and returns to her family's Luxembourg Palace apartments in Paris and the aristocratic social world she knows. There she gives birth to Lafayette's sister, who dies less than three months later. She returns to Chevenac to visit several times a year. Lafayette is fortunate in being raised by paternal family members. It was common for the nobility of the time to farm one's children out to be raised by governesses, nurses, and other outsiders. Lafayette is raised at Chevenac by his paternal grandmother, Madame de Motier, and his paternal unmarried Aunt Madeleine. Another paternal Aunt Charlotte, a widow with her daughter Marie, who is one year older than Lafayette, joins the family when Lafayette is five. Lafayette regards his cousin Marie as a sister. His early education, mainly in French and mathematics, is provided by several tutors, one of whom is a religious abbot. Lafayette's cousin Marie dies in childbirth while Lafayette is in America. He later recalls her death as one of his greatest sorrows. When I first started giving this presentation, this uh, image on the right, uh, I believe was Aunt Charlotte with Lafayette and a, and a uh, picture of the cousin. Uh, I have since found this image in older biographies that say that's his mother, not his aunt. And uh, the university where this image resides finesses the whole thing and says it's the Lafayette family. So I leave it up to you to decide whether that's Lafayette's mother or Aunt Charlotte. The formative years in Auvergne. In contrast to many in the aristocracy, Lafayette's grandmother while running Chavagnac is regarded as a respected and benevolent woman by the local peasants. One biographer has described Chavagnac as an island of liberty and a sea of feudal oppression. She makes a point of filling Lafayette with glorious stories of the adventures of all his soldier ancestors who are pictured throughout the castle. Lafayette thus develops a distaste for the British who killed his father. He acts out his military fantasies by roaming the estate playing war games, mock battles and military parades with the local peasant boys. In his memoirs, Lafayette recalls, from the time I was eight, I longed for glory. I remember nothing of my childhood more than my fervor for tales of glory and my plans to travel the world in the quest of fame. His fervor for glory is fueled by a desire to taint the, tame the beast of Gervadin, which appears on the scene when Lafayette is only eight years old. The mysterious beast is allegedly roaming the hills, killing livestock and murdering women and children, generating tall tales and folklore. Lafayette recalls, my heart beating with excitement to slay the hyena, the hope of encountering it enlivened my walks. Thus Lafayette's lifelong philosophy is formed. Honor, glory, and liberty, purchased at the price of courage, are the only goals in life. At age 11, Lafayette's mother takes him to Paris to live with her at the Luxembourg Palace. This is a picture of the Luxembourg Palace. At that time, it was divided up into luxury apartments. Away from Auvergne for the first time, he is amazed that people do not tip their hats to him as Lord of the Manor. He enrolls in the four-year College du Plessis just down the street, where as a member of the sword nobility, he is unusual. Most students come from less prestigious nobility of the robe, where the rank is based on judicial or government service. A few are even from bourgeois backgrounds on scholarship. It is here that Lafayette studies Latin and Greek, makes his first friends, and starts to exhibit traits of leadership. It is here that he excels in Latin scholarship. If the truth would be known, they sent him to the wrong school. This was a, a school that was beneath his position. And we will see what that does. 
On April 3rd, 1770, when Lafayette is but 12 years old, tragedy strikes. His mother dies and her father, his grandfather, passes away nine days later. Lafayette is now an only child orphan in the care of his great grandfather, the Count de la Riviere. His inheritance makes him a multimillionaire, one of the richest people in France. Still burning with desire to have a uniform, at age 13, his great-grandfather arranges for him to enter the Black Musketeers, soldiers of the King's Guard. He enjoys the ceremonial duty, but still wishes for a true command. Fabulously wealthy, Lafayette is now considered a great catch for those noble families looking for marriage partners for their daughters. While on vacation at Chavagnac at age 14, Lafayette learns that arrangements have been made for him to marry Adrienne, second daughter of the wealthy and influential Noailles family. Her father, Jean-Paul Francois de Noailles, the Duc de Lain, has five daughters to marry off and wants to limit his dowry exposure. Adrian's mother is furious because she does not want her 12 year old to marry until she has finished school and matured. The battle rages between Adrian's parents, but a compromise results in Lafayette moving in with the Noailles family for two years for the youngsters to get to know each other. Lafayette knows he will marry Adrienne, but she does not. In a twist of fate, he likes her and she falls head over heels for him it will turn out to be the beginning of a great love story. Once the arrangements are finalized in April 1773, the Duc procures a lieutenancy in the Noailles Dragoons for Lafayette and procures private lessons for him in military subjects. At about the same time, Adrienne's older sister Louise is betrothed to Louis, Vicomte de Noailles, cousin of the Duc d'Ain. Lafayette and the Vicomte soon become fast friends in the Dragoons as does Lafayette and Louis Count de Segur. Now you might ask, why would this guy Noai want his oldest daughter to marry another Noai? And the answer is very simple. He and his wife had two boys in their family, both of which died as infants. The one because his mother had smallpox during her pregnancy and she survived and the child didn't. So he did not want the name to, to uh, to peter out with uh, five girls. So he married his older daughter off to a cousin. Lafayette marries Adrian April 11th, 1774 at the Hotel Noailles in Paris. He is 16, she is 14. As a wedding present, the Duc de Ain has Lafayette promoted to captain in the Noailles regiment. He is expected to receive a command of a company at age 18. The couple continues to live with her parents. Three months after Lafayette's marriage, Louis XV dies and his grandson, Louis XVI, with his Austrian bride, Marie Antoinette, ascends to the throne of France. Lafayette is now enrolled in the Academy of Versailles, offering instruction in comportment and manners for children of the nobility at the king's court. A country boy, he does not fit in with the other, other upper crust students who have been practicing such things as dancing with grace and riding like a gentleman officer all their lives. So this is the school that he really should have been sent to to begin with. Lafayette's contemporaries in the nobility describe him as being tall. He topped out about six one, six foot, redheaded, gawky, clumsy, awkward, shy, reserved, a bad dancer, a poor rider, and having cold, reticent manners. His close friends even say he has a cold and serious bearing, which sometimes creates a false impression of timidity and embarrassment, but they reveal what is underneath, an active mind, a resolute character, a passionate spirit, and a brave and generous person. Lafayette is trapped in a situation for which he is temperamentally unsuited. He does not fit in at court as his father-in-law wishes and has no desire to. At one point, Queen Marie Antoinette breaks out in laughter at his dancing. 
Lafayette seals his fate at court when he deliberately insults the brother of Louis XVI and is not invited back. In May of 1775, Lafayette sets out for his second summer of Nawai regimental exercises in the French town of Metz near the German border. Interesting thing about this statue, it was uh, placed there in 2004. There had been a previous statue there that was destroyed by the Nazis. And for years, there was no statue and a group got together and said, we need a statue. So that's a fairly new statue there. Count de Broglie, then governor of Metz, becomes interested in Lafayette. He brings him into his circle of friends and introduces him to influential people. Lafayette, about to turn 18 in September, enjoys the attention of this senior officer and likes de Broglie, who in actuality is conducting covert operations for the king looking for ways to attack Britain. De Broglie has considered the idea of aiding the Americans as an opportunity for France, as well as an opportunity for him to replace George Washington as commander of the Continental Forces. Thus, in August, Lafayette is invited to dinner by de Broglie with Prince William Henry, the Duke of Gloucester, the out of favor brother of Britain's King George III. The prince is passing through France on his way to Italy. He is in sympathy with the American rebels and recounts stories of the battles of Lexington and Concord, Ethan Allen capturing Fort Ticonderoga, a Continental Congress having met, a Continental Army being formed and continuing military tensions around Boston. This is a watershed moment in Lafayette's life. Before he leaves the table, he imagines going to America to aid the Patriots. He believes that American freedom will influence the safety of France against the country that had caused his father's death. But there was another thing to consider. The French government was about to restructure how it populated its military due to the Seven Years' War debacle. No longer would just birth succession determine who, stayed, determine who stayed in the military. Competence and experience now counted. Lafayette's path to glory would eventually become blocked when on June 11, 1776, he was forced into the reserves and out of active duty. Both de Broglie and Prince William Henry were Masons and may have been influential in Lafayette becoming a Freemason during this period. Lafayette's membership in this fraternal society would serve him well in America, as Washington, Franklin, Hamilton, Hancock, and a number of other influential patriots were also Masons. The Lafayettes welcomed their first child, a daughter, Henriette, in December of 1775, when Lafayette is 18. The French government is sending spies to America and seeking an alliance with Spain against Britain, but openly staying neutral. Lafayette starts his plans to come to America. He confides in his two close from the dragoons, his brother-in-law Nawai, and his friend Segur, who would both like to go, but they lack funds and are forbidden by their parents. Just after the Declaration of Independence in July of 1776, Silas Dean arrives in Paris from America, seeking soldiers and help for the Patriots. De Broglie introduces Lafayette to German soldier of fortune, Baron de Kalb. De Kalb and Lafayette meet with Dean. The interesting thing about de Kalb was he was born a German peasant, and he decided that the, the way he would advance himself is to call himself a baron, which he did. And he joined the military and had an illustrious career. Lafayette does not want payment for his services, but he does want recognition by being appointed a major general in the Continental Army. Dean gives him his wish. Well, why would Dean do this? He did it because Lafayette was so fabulously wealthy and Lafayette's in-laws were very close to the King of France. When asked why go to America, Lafayette's answer is, why not? He puts these Latin words on his coat of arms, Kurna, why not? After some intrigue, when Lafayette's father-in-law learns of the plan and runs to King Louis XVI to forbid it, Lafayette de Kalb and their party sail for America on April 20th, 1777. With all the uproar about his departure, Lafayette has unwittingly scuttled de Broglie's plans to go to America and take over George Washington's command. 
Lafayette at age 19 and a half finds out that he is not a good sailor and spends the eight week voyage being seasick and trying to learn English and military tactics. So DeKalb was trying to help him with his military uh, education. And there was a, a gentleman named Bryce on board who was a, spoke English and was trying to teach him English. He writes a long effusive letter to Adrienne who had no knowledge of his plans and is pregnant with their second child. Interesting thing about this slide is I've been giving this presentation for a while and mispronouncing the guy's name. It's not Huger, it's Uji. The ship anchors off Georgetown Bay, South Carolina on June 13th, 1777. Lafayette and his party row up the river, see lights, and are entertained in true Southern style at the summer home of Major Benjamin Uji, who fortunately speaks French. Uger, Uji, conveys them to Charleston where they buy horses and totally unsuitable light carriages for the 900 mile trip to Philadelphia. The trip is filled with hardship. The equipment disintegrates, horses die, mosquitoes attack, and the travelers come down with swamp fever and dysentery. While the other officers complain, Lafayette remains upbeat. Back in France on July 1, 1777, Adrian gives birth to their second daughter and names her Anastasi. Lafayette will not know of this for months. Prior to Lafayette's arrival, the American Revolution has progressed through several phases. The Boston Tea Party, Boston Massacre, Battles of Lexington and Concord and Bunker Hill have all taken place. The British have sailed away from Boston for New York City and have won the Battle of Brooklyn. Washington and his army have barely escaped across the East River to Manhattan and have lost that as well, fleeing across the Hudson to Fort Lee and retreating across New Jersey to Philadelphia. At Christmas of 1776, Washington's army has crossed the Delaware River to surprise the Hessians at Trenton. Following a victory at Princeton, the remainder of the winter is spent in camp at Morristown, New Jersey. In the spring of 1777, the army moves to the colonial capital of Philadelphia to protect it from the British who sail forces from occupied New York City around the tip of New Jersey into the Chesapeake Bay and land at Elkton, Maryland to attack. Lafayette's bedraggled party reaches Philadelphia and is rebuffed by members of Congress who are tired of being bombarded by obnoxious egotistical French mercenaries sent by Silas Dean. Dean was supposed to go there and recruit half a dozen engineers, and he was sending all these people across the water. Lafayette returns to his quarters and writes a letter to Congress. He says that after the sacrifices he has made, he has the right to two favors, one to serve at his own cost, and two to begin his service as a volunteer. Well, Congress liked that because they didn't have money to pay him anyway. That, and an endorsement by Benjamin Franklin, does the trick for him at least, and he is introduced to George Washington at the city tavern on August 3rd, 1777. Washington is in his forties with no biological children. Lafayette will turn 20 in a month and is an orphan. They take to each other and form a father-son relationship that will last until Washington's death. And by the way, in case you find that kind of relationship far-fetched, something very similar happened to me not so long ago. Now I'm not comparing myself to Washington, mind you, and he would not compare himself to Lafayette, but in the summer of 2017, during the American Friends of Lafayette weekend at my home in Easton at Lafayette College, I hosted a young French graduate student at my home. Within 48 hours, I knew I was dealing with an extraordinary young man. We bonded like Washington and Lafayette, and now he is like the grandson I never had. His name is Julian. And I will tell you a bit more about him later in the program. Lafayette joins the ragtag army one week later as part of Washington's family, his aides. About the same age as Hamilton, Burr, and Monroe, he endears himself by stating, I have come to learn and not to teach. Just the opposite of the egotistical Frenchman they have run into before. Washington, however, soon becomes troubled when he realizes that the young Lafayette expects an actual command, not just the honorary total title of Major General. 
Washington is now tasked with preventing British General Howe and his forces from overrunning Philadelphia. He holds a strategy session with his generals at Molen House, southeast of Doylestown, where Lafayette attends his first council of war. The Battle of Brandywine. Howe's forces are advancing north from Elkton, Maryland to attack the colonial capital. On September 11, 1777, the Continental Army intercepts them at Brandywine Creek in Chads Ford, Pennsylvania, southwest of the city. We have a bunch of images of Lafayette at Brandywine. The thing you have to remember about all these uh, paintings is that they're, they're what the artist had in his mind's eye, an idealized look at what he thought it must have looked like. This is a very famous one of Lafayette of Brandywine. But, you know, the artist was not out there on the battlefield painting this. While Lafayette does not have a command at the Battle of Brandywine, he is front and center trying to organize the eventual retreat. He takes a bullet in the left calf, a flesh wound, but keeps on until his boot fills with blood and aides remove him from the field of battle. The Continentals have been routed by the British. Washington sees to it that Lafayette is cared for by his personal physician. He is taken by water to Philadelphia and then north to Bristol, Pennsylvania. Henry Lawrence, president of the Continental Congress, drives him by carriage to the Moravian settlement of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania to recuperate for four weeks. He spends his first several days at the Sun Inn. If you're not familiar with our area, the Sun Inn still stands. If it weren't for COVID, you could probably go for, to dinner there. I don't know whether it's open at the moment or not. He is then hosted at a private home the, for the remainder of his recuperation. Now the Beckel home no longer stands, but there is a story that goes, uh, it can't be proven because it's just word of mouth through the Beckel family that uh, Liesel Beckel, the daughter, became enamored of Lafayette while he was with them. And we don't know whether the story is true or not, but the, it is a fact that Liesel never did marry. Lafayette's fame is beginning to spread throughout the colonies. He actually claims he's ecstatic at having been wounded. He becomes the spin doctor of the time, writing letters promoting the Patriot cause and magnifying his exploits to friends and family in France, as well as to key ministers in the King's government. Meanwhile, Washington tries a surprise attack on the British who are camped at Germantown, but fails to stop the eventual overrun of Philadelphia. Continental Congress members are forced to relocate to Lancaster and later York, Pennsylvania. The Liberty Bell is transported to Allentown, Pennsylvania, where it is hidden under the floor of a church. Back in France, Lafayette's first child, Henriette, passes away at age 22 months. But again, it will take months for him to learn the news. Rejoining the army, Lafayette is given his first command under General Green. British General Cornwallis was across the river in New Jersey. Lafayette is given 400 men for reconnaissance. He attacks the Hessian outpost at Gloucester and the Hessians retreat. He presses on until Cornwallis arrives with backup and then he retires. Washington now makes a major decision to give Lafayette command of a division. At this point in the war, Washington has been able to push the British out of Boston, but he has lost the Battle of Brooklyn, lost control of New York City, and lost the colonial capital of Philadelphia. His two small victories have been the surprise attack on the Hessians at Trenton and the victory at Princeton. General Horatio Gates, fresh from his tremendous win at Saratoga, New York, near Albany, wants to overthrow Washington as commander in chief of the Continental Army. He convinces Congress to make himself president of a board of war. And in concert with General Conway, they lobby to remove Washington as commander in chief. Lafayette is anguished by this disloyalty and in his still boyish way, emotionally and steadfastly supports Washington. The attempt to overthrow Washington fails. The detail that I have not put in this presentation is they actually wanna get Lafayette out of the way. So they send him on a fool's errand 
to upstate New York telling him he's going to have troops up there to attack Canada. And he gets up there, there are no supplies and no troops. The only thing good that came out of that trip was he met a bunch of Oneida Indians and made friends with them. The army now goes into the well-known winter of hardship at Valley Forge. While camped at Valley Forge, Baron von Steuben from Prussia is created, credited with shaping Washington's Continental Army into a well-drilled machine. News of an alliance with France arrives at Valley Forge on May 1, 1778, along with news of Lafayette's second daughter, Anastasi's birth, nine months after the actual event. Three months earlier, on February 6, 1778, the day of the treaty signing in France, Benjamin Franklin, Silas Dean, and John Adams had been presented to King Louis XVI. They then went to visit Lafayette's wife, Adrienne. Lafayette, the spin doctor, is credited for the alliance due to his adventurous departure from France and his letters home with exaggerated tales of adventure and success. So why do we honor the Marquis? This is the first reason. While in camp at Valley Forge during the winter of 1777-1778, Lafayette writes this sentence in a letter to his father-in-law. It's inscribed on the pedestal of his statue in front of Colton Chapel on the Lafayette College campus. The succeeding sentence of the letter puts it in context. He's saying, I don't want to be viewed as this egotistical know-it-all. In May of 1778, at age 20, Lafayette gets his first real test of his military leadership skills at Barron Hill today named Lafayette Hill, southeast of Plymouth Meeting, Pennsylvania. Washington receives intelligence that the British, having heard of the impending arrival of French warships due to this new treaty, are readying to evacuate Philadelphia. Wanting to know if this is the truth or a ruse, he places Lafayette in charge of a 2,200-man reconnaissance mission. Washington cautions Lafayette not to be surprised by the enemy and lose his best men. Well, if any of you out there have raised teenagers, you know that they don't particularly listen. And Lafayette finds a nice clearing and camps there for two days. British General Howe in his last days in command gets wind of the mission and cockily sends out British forces to surround and capture Lafayette, who he, whom he sarcastically refers to as the boy. According to Lafayette's later writings, Howe goes so far as to invite the ladies of Philadelphia to dinner with the Frenchman, whom he expects to have as a prisoner by nightfall. Howe's plans fail when Lafayette realizes he is being surrounded by 5,000 enemy troops. Making observations from the steeple of the Lutheran church and keeping his head, he leaves a few men to make a lot of noise for the British and his main force retreats down a low-lying road out of sight of the enemy. By the time the British closed the trap, Lafayette has escaped. Lafayette did something very smart. He got his Oneida Indians to stay behind, take a shot from behind a tree, scamper behind another tree. So he, he had a small group of Indians making a lot of noise and the British thought the whole army was there. And when they finally tried to close the trap, they almost fired on each other. Monmouth, led by Sir Henry Clinton, the British evacuate Philadelphia and set off for New York City by land across New Jersey. You might ask, oh, they came from New York by boat. Why didn't they go back that way? Well, some of them did, but a lot of them went by land across New Jersey. At a council of war, Lafayette and other generals advocate a full assault on the enemy. Major General Charles Lee and Benedict Arnold lead another faction saying they are no match for the British. Washington decides on a middle course. The Continentals will harass the withdrawing British, but will, will be willing to engage if the British make a stand. Thus, Washington and his army pursue the British across the state, culminating in the Battle of Monmouth, June 28, 1778, the longest contest of the revolution fought in oppressive heat and humidity. Lafayette lobbies for and is put in charge of the advance force with 4,400 men to attack the enemy's left flank and rear. 
This would normally have been Lee's command as a senior officer. Lee has second thoughts and asks for the command back. Washington agrees and Lafayette defers to the older Lee. At one point, Lee disobeys Washington's orders to attack and retreats. Washington is furious. Overnight, the British slip away. Lafayette becomes, becomes even closer to Washington. He recalls that they pass the night on the same cloak, discussing Lee's actions. The Battle of Monmouth goes down in history as a partial victory for the Patriots, and Lee ends up being court-martialed. Now, this next section of my presentation, you are never going to find in a general biography of Lafayette because it's about my hometown of Hohokus, New Jersey. But I figure if you got it, use it. So here it is. The army is on the move after the Battle of Monmouth. Lafayette's in charge of one of three divisions and they're moving towards Paramus, New Jersey. When they get to Paramus, uh, the court martial of Lee continues at Paramus Church. One of uh, Washington's aides, Dr. James McHenry writes, the general received a note of an invitation from Mrs. Prevo to make her hermitage, as it was called, the seat of his stay while at Paramus. At Mrs. Prevo, we found some fair refugees, i.e. young ladies, from New York, who were on a visit to the lady of the hermitage. With them, we talked and walked and laughed and danced and gallanted away the leisure hours of four days and four nights. Many towns can claim that Washington slept there, but my town can claim that he and Lafayette danced there. Thevio, Theodosia Prevo were later, later marry Aaron Burr at the hermitage which is now in Hohokus, New Jersey. In colonial times, the area called Paramus is now five or six other town names today. While at the Hermitage, Washington receives word of the arrival of the French fleet off Sandy Hook, commanded by Count d'Estaing, and enlists Lafayette's aides in communicating with him. D'Estaing is from the Auvergne region of France where Lafayette was born. Because of my dual interest in Hohokus history and Lafayette, I discovered a letter in the Washington papers that's from Washington asking Lafayette to find out about this story he's heard at the Hermitage about a, a uh, gift being sent to his wife Martha by Marie Antoinette that supposedly was captured by the British in New York and auctioned off. So we have this half of the, of the story, but we don't have the other half because no letter from Lafayette replying to Washington has yet been found. And this is what the Hermitage must have looked like back in the revolution. This is what it looks like today. It was saved because one family, the Rosencrantzes, lived there for generations. The last lady dying in poverty, but willing it to, to the uh, state of New Jersey for a museum and park. Back to the main action, Newport. The Stang finds that New York Harbor is too shallow for his ships, negating an attack on New York City and agrees to sail to Rhode Island. Lafayette is sent there with a troop detachment to join General Sullivan. When he arrives, General Green is given half his force. Lafayette arrives in Providence on August 4, 1778 to find that Sullivan has not gathered the militia together. The Stang's ships have arrived, but they are out of food and suffering from scurvy. There is a nine day delay during which Lafayette acts as a diplomat shuttling back and forth between Sullivan and Destang. A plan to attack Newport is finally agreed to, but Sullivan jumps the gun by a day. Destang is furious. The British fleet arrives and Destang starts to engage them, but a storm breaks up both fleets. Destang refuses to pursue Newport and sails to Boston for repairs. Lafayette and Sullivan almost get into a duel. Lafayette rides to Boston to urge rapid repairs and Destang's return. He returns to Rhode Island two days later, but the British fleet shows up on the Continental's retreat. A major battle for Newport never really happens. While in Rhode Island, Lafayette writes this well-known quote about his feelings for America. Can you just imagine 
anybody here 21 years old writing such a thing? The moment I heard of America, I loved her. The moment I knew she was fighting for freedom, I burnt with a desire of bleeding for her. And the moment I shall be able to serve her at any time or any part of the world will be the happiest of my life. Heady stuff. This is his signature. Lafayette's fame has now spread throughout the colonies. He is referred to widely as our Marquis. Ironically, it is about this time that Lafayette, filled with the idea of liberty for all, drops his title when signing his correspondence. Forever after, he calls himself just Lafayette. The winter is coming and Lafayette, seeing a lull in the fighting, now asks for a leave of absence from the Continental Army to go home and see his wife and surviving daughter. He also has dreams of talking Louis XVI into invading England. He has granted the leave and Congress writes the King glowing reviews of his service to the American cause. Before he can leave, however, he succumbs to a serious fever after a long horseback ride in the rain. At Fishkill, New York, he is attended to by Washington's physician, Dr. John Cochran. Lafayette is sick for several weeks and almost dies. Now we have another very handsome fellow here. He was a Revolutionary War surgeon by the name of James Thatcher. And he wrote a volume called Thatcher's Military Journal. In that volume, we have this quote. He visited Lafayette while he was recovering. He says he's near, we want to know what he really looked like. He describes him nearly six feet high, large, but not corpulent. Being of not more than 21 years of age, he is not very elegant in his form, his shoulders being broad and high, nor is there perfect symmetry in his features, his forehead re remarkably high, his nose large and long, eyebrows prominent and projecting over a fine animated hazel eye. His countenance is interesting and impressive. He converses in broken English and displays the manners and address of an accomplished gentleman. So now we know a little bit more about what he looked like. He had red, reddish strawberry blonde hair, a long nose, prominent eyebrows, and hazel eyes. Lafayette finally sails for France on January 11, 1779 on the Frigate Alliance, the jewel of the young American Continental Navy. He will spend a little over a year in France. On his arrival, he is treated as a hero. The king cannot compete with his popularity and only puts him on a short house arrest for disobeying when he left France to join the Patriot effort. His reunion with Adrian results in the birth of yet another child in December of 1779. Lafayette names the boy George Washington Lafayette. Lafayette would love to don a French uniform and fight the British anywhere, but his lobbying finally results in France agreeing to send an expeditionary army and naval force to America to aid the Patriots. Lafayette is itching to be its commander, but it is not to be. The force will be led by Count Rochambeau with Admiral de Grasse in charge of the French Armada. The king, however, gives Lafayette the honor of going ahead of the force to inform Washington they are coming. Lafayette dons his Continental Army uniform and leaves on March 14, 1780, aboard the new French frig frigate Hermione. He lands at Boston on April 27, 1780, and soon joins Washington in camp at Morristown, New Jersey, where he gives him the good news. When I first saw this, I, I never realized how short Hamilton is. He's a little shrimpy guy compared to Lafayette and even taller George Washington. Rochambeau and his forces arrive in Rhode Island on July 10th, 1780. The complement of men includes Lafayette's close friend from the Noailles Dragoons, his brother-in-law, Louis Viscount de Noailles, who will later serve with Lafayette at Yorktown. During the mid to latter part of the year, Washington keeps the Continental Army in the vicinity of New York City, camping in several different spots in today's Bergen and Passaic counties in New Jersey, while considering an assault on the city. In August, two brigades are selected from different regiments of the main army to form a corps of life infantry, commanded by Lafayette. 
The Marquis is delighted with his command and at his own expense provides them with extra equipment. The friendship between Lafayette and Hamilton deepens and Lafayette makes several suggestions for appointments on Lafayette's behalf. By September, Washington and Lafayette are at West Point when Benedict Arnold is unmasked as a traitor. His wife, Peggy Shippen Arnold, learns the news and acts like a deranged woman. She completely fools Washington, Lafayette, and Hamilton, and they let her go back to her family in Philadelphia. Historians later find evidence that she was just as guilty as her husband. And by the way, she was a friend of Theodosia Prevo, and on the way back to Philadelphia, she stops at the Hermitage and confesses to Theodosia and Aaron Burr. In February of 1781, Washington sends Lafayette south to Virginia. Lafayette first meets Thomas Jefferson and they become lifelong friends. Lafayette is able to scare off the British from a battle for Richmond by making it appear that he has more forces than he does. Richmond, a key city full of supplies and armaments is saved, but later after supplies have been hidden in the hills, Richmond is evacuated. Lafayette continues a holding action with his small force until reinforcements arrive. Washington and Rochambeau have finally agreed that an assault on rested troops in New York City makes no sense, but striking British General Cornwallis in Virginia does. French troops from Rhode Island join American Northern forces on the trek down to Virginia along what today is known as W3R, the Washington Rochambeau Revolutionary Route. interesting thing about this painting is that several biographies of Lafayette mis uh, identify people. They say that the guy pointing is Lafayette. It's not. Lafayette is obviously behind Washington's shadow where the arrow is, and that's Roche Rochambeau pointing. Uh, Continental Army uniforms were blue and buff. Uh, Rochambeau is in blue and white, and he's got a very fancy trim on his uh, uniform. And even if you go down to uh, the new Revolutionary War Museum in Philadelphia, this painting is blown up on the wall and it's, it's got the people misnamed. So again, we have a number of paintings of what artists thought things looked like. This is Washington and Tench Tillman, who was a Marylander and was given the honor of taking the capitulation papers back to Congress. And he's, he's holding them in this painting with Lafayette in between them. Again, another idealized what they thought they looked like. Part of the problem with all this is that they didn't have photography. You didn't know exactly what these people looked like. James Armistead, a slave, served as a spy for the Marquis de Lafayette during the American Revolution at Yorktown. Later, as a free name, free man, James changed his name to James Lafayette. In fact, he was a double agent. He posed as a, as a runaway slave and made his way into Cornwallis's camp. And he was very valuable to Lafayette because he was one of the few black slaves who was literate. Many people say the painting on the left that that's James Armistead. Uh, people have done research on this, don't think so. He's, he's dressed too, too well. And uh, artists of that time were, were famous for throwing black servants into their, into their paintings. I would direct you to watch the, the painting on the left and then look at this. This monument in Prospect Park, Brooklyn was patterned after the painting you just saw. A copy of Lafayette's figure later became the statue in front of Colton Chapel on the Lafayette College campus. There's a very interesting story about this that I've written about. It, it was a chance meeting on the on a train of an alumnus of Lafayette College and Daniel Chester French, who did uh, both of the uh, artistic pieces. Of course, Daniel Chester French is best known for his seated 
Lincoln in Washington, DC. So what was Lafayette's major contribution to assuring that we are an independent nation today and not British subjects? Why do we honor him? One, surely his letters home following Brandywine helped move the French government to send to Stein and his forces. And, sure, and two, surely his lobbying on his return to France resulted in the major additional commitment under Rochambeau, resulting in the victory at Yorktown. In four short years, from age 20 to 24, he had gained the confidence of George Washington and proven himself as a commander on the battlefield as well. Lafayette returns to France in triumph at age 24, arriving home in January of 1782. The fame he has acquired in the American War propels him to the rank of Marshal de Camp in the French army. In September of 1782, the Lafayettes have their last child, a girl. Lafayette names her Marie Antoinette Virginie for his adopted father's home state. Two and a half years later, in 1784, Lafayette returns to America for a five-month visit at the invitation of Washington. He travels to 10 states from Virginia to New England and has two long visits with Washington at Mount Vernon. It will be the last time he sees his adopted father. During this trip, Maryland grants citizenship to Lafayette and his male heirs, a very important point which we shall see. So again, we have a bunch of idealized paintings of Washington greeting Lafayette. Lafayette College happens to own this one. There's another one. And another one. There are still more than these. While visiting, Lafayette discovers that his faithful James Armistad is still in slavery. He lobbies the Virginia legislature and is successful in having James emancipated. The problem was Virginia law of that time emancipated blacks who served in the army, but Armistad wasn't in the army. He was a civilian spy. Lafayette returns to France on the frigate La Nymphe, but it will not be his last visit to his adopted country. So what did he really look like? Well, a life mask was taken of him at age 28. And from that, Houdin did busts of him. The bust on the right, you can actually buy today a copy of it. Now I said, we're really not gonna cover the French Revolution and that part of his life, but suffice it to say that during the French Revolution, Lafayette is captured and held as a political prisoner in Prussia and Austria. He later is joined in Olmutz prison by wife Adrienne and daughters Anastasi and Virginie, who request to be with him. Basically, Lafayette during the French Revolution wanted a constitutional monarchy. So he was kind of a middle of the road guy that everybody learned to hate. And he eventually had to flee uh, France, and he, fleed right, he fled right into countries that uh, were monarchies and uh, wanted him in prison. My friend Julian talks about uh, the French view of Lafayette today, and I'll quote him. Lafayette has sunk into oblivion in France as the national memory doesn't recognize his achievements. Today, the liberals don't hold him up because he supported the monarchy, and the conservatives don't embrace him because he was a troublemaker who championed the rights of the people. Adrienne, using Lafayette citizenship in the state of Maryland, has been able to keep their son, George Washington Lafayette, from harm. She has sent him to stay with his namesake in America. George Washington Lafayette stays for a time with Alexander Hamilton in New York City, and later with Washington in the president's house, Philadelphia, and at Mount Vernon. After the Lafayette's release from prison, Adrian takes charge and is able to get the Lafayette repatriated to France, where she recovers this property, which had been confiscated during the French Revolution from her family. So well, this is Lagrange. You've heard of uh, Lagrange 
towns have named LaGrange in several states. This is where it comes from. She and Lafayette will live here for the rest of their lives. The next slide is an interesting slide. It's a painting of a painting on the left. And the, the actual painting is on the right. Uh, Lafayette asked Washington for a portrait and Washington had this painted and sent to him and it hung over his bedchamber at Lagrange for years. Uh, it's in the safety of Lafayette College at the moment. Now here's another view of Lagrange. The nation's guest. Lafayette's 1824-25 triumphal tour of America. 40 years after his visit in 1784, Congress had President Monroe invite Lafayette to return to tour his adopted country. He is 67 now and having lost his fortune in the French Revolution is financially strapped. As part of the trip, he is presented with $200,000 and a land grant in Tallahassee, Florida. During the 13 month tour, he, his son, George Washington Lafayette, his secretary, Auguste Levasseur, and his valet Bastien visit all 24 states, some of them twice. He travels by land and water, and at one point is even shipwrecked on a riverboat, but escapes unharmed. When he visits Massachusetts, he lays the cornerstone for the Bunker Hill Monument and his son collects a trunk full of soil to be taken back to France. Everywhere he goes, cities and towns try to outdo one another to show their adulation. There are parades, triumphal arches, and banquets galore. All sorts of souvenir memorabilia are produced and hundreds of locations named for him. Cities, towns, parks, streets, businesses, Lafayette, Fayette, and Lagrange all refer to the hero of two worlds. While in Philadelphia in September of 1824, Lafayette greets a delegation from Eastern Pennsylvania led by James Madison Porter, an event which results in the founding of Lafayette College. So after that meeting, right after Christmas in 1824, meetings held at White's Hotel in Center Square Easton, takes over a year to March of 1826 to get the Commonwealth to give them a charter. And then the college is stillborn for six years. And finally, George Junkin moves his manual labor academy from Germantown to a rented farm on South Side Easton and the rest is history. If it hadn't been for the triumphal tour of 1824, 1825, Lafayette College would not have had such an illustrious name. And while we were talking about the farewell tour, let me tell you this story. In 2015, at the arrival of the reconstructed ship Hermion at Yorktown, Virginia, members of the American Friends of Lafayette first met French student Julian Isha, who was doing graduate work at the College of William and Mary. By the way, Google they have American Friends of Lafayette and join them. It's a fun group. Lafayette got very interested in the Marquis and our society and returned from France for our 2016 annual meeting, which was held in Boston. While with us at a function at the French Consul General's residence, Julian proposed working with the consul. The result was that he developed the project and was hired as an intern to map General Lafayette's footsteps throughout New England during the farewell tour. Julian's education is in history and geography. He has two masters in geography. Uh, so this is a project that was a natural for him. On the right, you see the interactive map you can go to at the lafayettetrail.org and play with. Uh, any circle that has numbers in it, that's the number of stops that are within that circle. And you, you click on them and the map keeps enlarging. And when you get to no numbers in the circle, you're at a particular point and you will see a, an image and a description of what Lafayette did there. It's a lot of fun to, to play with that map. He spent five months in 2017 visiting all the places where Lafayette trod in New England. 
and created an interactive mapping program documenting the exact route. 170 stops that the general made are shown with images and text at each. The project is called the Lafayette Trail, and you can view his work at www.thelafayettetrail.org. Once his New England internship was over, Julian came back from France to finish mapping the remaining 18 states and a total of 800 locations that Lafayette visited. In addition, Julian has lectured about the trail to a number of historic groups, written many articles for publication, and has received significant publicity for his events, efforts to increase mutual understanding between the peoples of France and the US. The Lafayette Trail Inc. has formed an exclusive partnership with the William J. Pomeroy Foundation, and Julian is currently working with them to install historic signage along the route and preparation for the bicentennial of the tour in 2024. The Pomeroy Foundation has pledged to pay for the manufacture and installation, uh, manufacture and shipping rather, of uh, as many as 175 signs. I'm the treasurer of the trail, and as we speak, I have ordered 65 of them. Julian was also honored to be a member of the French cultural delegation during French President Macron's state visit to the US in April of 2018. With its internet base, this project is expected to introduce millions to learn about the marquee. Expect to hear a lot more about this talented young man. And now, while this presentation is free, here's a brief commercial announcement from the treasurer of the Lafayette Trail, Inc., me. We are in need of a substantial amount of funds to complete installing between 125 and 175 historical markers along the trail by the bicentennial in 2024. Pomeroy funds the, the manufacture and shipping but all the research and everything that goes behind it and working with the various towns and, and organizations to get the signs accepted and put up costs money. You may help us by joining the Lafayette Trail as a member or by making a donation to our 501c3 tax exempt company on our website, thelafayettetrail.org. We thank you for your consideration. And if you join for $50 as a member, you get to read our newsletters. When this slide was done, we were expecting to have them twice a year. It turns out we're having them four times a year and they run between 60 and 80 pages in length. And if you get them, you will get to read a series that I am writing called Trail Tales about Lafayette's adventures along the trail. A lot of human interest, exciting stories. In September of 1825, at the end of the triumphal tour, Lafayette leaves his adopted country for the last time on the ship Brandywine. Lafayette dies on May 20th, 1834 at 76 years of age, knowing that a college had been founded to honor him in Eastern Pennsylvania. We know this because the Franklin Literary Society at the college wrote him a letter and while they never got a reply, the letter was found with his effects after he died. He went to a funeral, caught a chill, came very ill, and as he was starting to recuperate, this sudden storm came up while he was in an open uh, carriage and his condition worsened and he finally passed away. This is Picpus Cemetery in Paris. It's where the mass graves of over 1,300 killed in the French Reign of Terror are located under the gravel in the front of the slide and in the back. And this uh, was found, uh, let's go back, uh, Adrian, his, his wife's relatives were killed uh, in the terror at the guillotine. She lost her grandmother, her mother, and her older sister, Louise. She could have gone, but Governor Morris was able to get her name pushed down on the list uh, and Robespierre was overthrown before they got to her. And then um, James Monroe was able to get her released from prison. But she and other uh, aristocrats tried to find out where all their, their, their uh, 
people were being buried and uh, somebody surreptitiously followed the cart of bodies one night and they found and they bought this cemetery and set up a chapel there. And this is where Lafayette and his wife are buried today in Picpus. So these are the graves. You can see they're behind the walls. And he's buried with a trunk full of American soil back, brought back from Bunker Hill uh, as part of the triumphal tour. Every year on or around the 4th of July, we're trying to make it actually on the 4th of July more often. Uh, honorary ceremonies are held at the grave site. The American Friends of Lafayette always has a representative there and places uh, a wreath. And it's interesting that through both world wars, the American flag has flown, has flown over his grave because of its secluded place. There's a famous uh, quotation uh, attributed to General John J. Pershing, which he didn't really say. General Pershing arrives in World War I, parades through the streets of Paris, uh, and visits Lafayette's grave. His colonel, Charles Stanton, uh, wrote an address at, to be said at the graveside, and uh, Pershing uh, approved it, and he had Stanton say it in English. And at the end of the of the uh, presentation, Stanton gestures at the grave and says, "Lafayette, we are here." So Charles Stanton actually said it, but Pershing, a lot of times, is is attributed to to uh, having said it, which he didn't. There's an interesting story about Pershing, which I don't know whether is true, but it's. it's since it's interesting, I'll tell it. When Pershing was in second grade, he was supposed to recite Mary Had a Little Lamb and he went blank. And for the rest of his life, he hated public speaking. So he did a very short introduction of Stanton and let Stanton give the speech. Uh, I found another slide of this event uh, with uh, the Marquis de Chambrun. He's a great grandson of Lafayette's daughter, Virginia. Recommended further reading. Uh, I picked these two books because they're both very easy to read. The Unger book uh, called Lafayette in 2007 at the 250th anniversary of Lafayette's birth, Lafayette College had this printed in a, in a special edition. The Jason Lane book, is also another easy read. And we have the parent of a Lafayette graduate who's a local guy, Jeff Finnegan. He's part of the Finnegan Funeral Home Dynasty, uh, writes books about George Washington. And he wrote this particular one, My Dear General, The Extraordinary Relationship of George Washington and the Marquis de Lafayette. His books are targeted at younger readers and local artist Preston Hindenmark uh, illustrated his books. If you're interested in our research, one of the few times that Julian had company going around doing his research, what he called boots on the ground, was with me in New Jersey, because I'm a New Jersey native, and uh, we got in the car and drove all over New Jersey, and one of the communications people from Lafayette College followed us around and wrote this article. It's very interesting in, in what he went through to come up with this primary research to prove uh, all these signs he's placing. Um, to get to it, just go to lafayette.edu and uh, search for On the Trail of General Lafayette. These are the two gentlemen who portray Lafayette these days. Mark Schneider on the left uh, is an employee of Colonial Williamsburg, works in the Tidewater area of Virginia. Um, he also loves to portray Napoleon, which is very interesting. On the right is Ben Goldman, 
Ben works, uh, Ben does not do this as a full-time job. He has a, a regular job, but uh, he works out of Washington, DC. And he told us a very interesting story of the, one of the first times he portrayed Lafayette, he was doing it at the White House for a visit of French President Sarkozy. So he and a, a Washington reenactor did their thing. They were, they were very happy to get through it and be done. And uh, then they had a photo op and President Sarkozy came up to Ben and said, where in France are you from? Ben said, I'm an American Jew. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ben happens to love the French language. All of his uh, secondary and tertiary education has been uh, studying French. So he's very fluent and he was able to, to fool the, the president of France. If you had enjoyed this presentation but are overwhelmed by the length of it, there's a shortened version which you can ref refresh your memory from. Go to the lafayettetrail.org, scroll down to additional resources, pick about Lafayette and pick the PDF where the pictures will show and you will see my basic summary of this presentation. And we have come to the end of the road. Well, John, on behalf of the members of the Valley Forge chapter of the Sons of the American Revolution here in the Lehigh Valley, I want to thank you for your presentation. You're welcome. It was wonderful. And uh, since you are a fellow compatriot, no doubt I'll see you again soon. Soon, yes. yes. Thank you all for joining us. And thanks again to the folks at the uh, Bethlehem Masonic Center for allowing us to host this event. Thank all of you for joining us. Take care.